I'm Phyllis Sarnan, uh, the facilitator for this program on the science of paleontology. And um, uh, as I mentioned before, we were going to have six lectures uh, all on the history of evolution of life on Earth. And um, I hope that you all will enjoy it. Uh, just to put in a plug, uh, instead of the five following lectures that are in the uh, program for the ILR bulletin, we have actually six because we were able to fit Dr. John Block in at the last minute. So uh, he'll be lecturing on November 8th, which is election day, and uh, sorry, the end conflict, and uh, he'll be uh, followed then by Dr. Richard Hulbert on the 15th. Uh, originally, I wanted to have a field trip at the end uh, to go to see the special exhibit at the Florida Museum of Natural History, Fantastic Fossils. It's a great exhibit to go see, uh, especially if you've been through our little course here, uh, because you'll have so much more uh, uh, background and context to understand it. And also, of course, uh, the fossil hall at Florida Museum is one of the best. I mean, it's really good. Uh, I've been to so many natural history museums around the country, and this one is exceptional. Of course, it's limited to the ancient animals of Florida, which will be uh, covered by Dr. Hulbert at the very final lecture. So, so today we have the pleasure of visiting by uh, Dr. Steve Manchester, a paleobotanist with the Florida Museum of Natural History. Uh, Dr. Manchester has been with the Florida Museum since 1990, researching and teaching in the field of paleobotany, the study of ancient plants and their evolution within the larger frame of biological evolution. Previously, Steve was an associate scientist and curator of fossil plants at Indiana University of Bloomington, where he earned his PhD in the field. As curator of paleobotany at the Florida Museum, Dr. Manchester is responsible for a very large collection, 250,000 fossil plant specimens, as well as the 200,000 specimen, excuse me, 20,000 specimen John W. Hall collection transferred from the University of Minnesota. Uh, and that's not the only transfer that has been made to uh, our university, Florida Museum of Natural History. Uh, we we are well known across the country as one of the biggest and best natural history museums. Dr. Manchester's research deals mainly with the geologic history of flowering plants, documenting the histories of various plant families and using those histories to understand the effects of climate change over the last hundred million years. As an adjunct professor in the departments of biology and geology, he teaches or has taught nine courses at UF on plant geography, paleontology, and or palynology, the study of pollen and spores. He has published more than 200 peer-reviewed scientific articles and book chapters, and at present he's advising four PhD candidates. In his spare time, he serves as president of the International Organization of Paleobotany. Dr. Manchester, please. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Phyllis, for organizing and making me sound like somebody special. <laughs> you oh, I didn't know how to turn it. Yeah. There we go. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that nice introduction. And thank you for organizing this session, Phyllis. I, as uh, was mentioned, I'm a paleobotanist. So paleo, I work with fossils, but botany, um, dealing with plants and uh, for fossil plants, we find leaves we, uh, that preserved as impressions in shale, we find pollen, we find petrified wood, all of these things can give us some uh, insights into past vegetation. And I've been particularly interested in fossil seeds and fossil nuts and uh, 
particularly those uh, flowering plants. Well, fruits are produced only by flowering plants, and flowering plants go back, what, 100, 140 million years or so. And my research has been mostly on the last only 60 million years, and going to, to geologic strata in Wyoming and Oregon and different places and collecting these fossil nuts. Is that okay? The light on? Yeah, I think okay. that's good. Thank you. Uh, I'm pushing the right arrow and that slides Sometimes out in advance. Click real quick. Okay, okay now, now it's just slide. slide. We might, we might there we go. Have. Okay. <laughs> uh, on the left, you can see a bowl of fossil nuts. Those are all uh, petrified or they've been replaced with silica or you might say then agatized. And they were collected from these hills behind those uh, this group of people, including myself on the left there. This is in Eastern Oregon, called the Farno Nut Beds. And this is part of the John Day Fossil Beds uh, National Monument now. Although we were able to collect before they started, <laughs> it became a monument and they restricted uh, collecting to the extent they have now. But so I got interested uh, early on as a high school student, I went to the summer camp that was adjacent to this locality and we could go and collect these fossil nuts. And it was disappointing to me that our counselors couldn't identify all these fossils for us. They said, well, that's interesting. We'll have to study them more. And so I'm still working basically on this project that I started as a high school student. Uh, this is uh, a couple of pages out of a book that I published on this diverse fossil fruit and seed flora from, or nut and seed flora from uh, that same locality. Uh, this came out years ago, 1994, um, when we could photograph things only, you know, with reflected light and standard methods. We, some things like figure 13, that was an electron microscope picture, but uh, we didn't have the CT scan and some of the tools that we can use now. Um, so if I wanted to see the insides of something, uh, I would have to put a, a diamond saw blade through, like in figure 17 in the lower right, right hand panel. Uh, that uh, saw cut revealed what we see in figure 18. And uh, across the top right, the uh, with second row on or part of yeah here we are three two nine those are all fossil walnuts and those are the oldest walnuts we know of so this is going back 45 million years or 46 or so depending on the dates that you choose to believe there are grape seeds here these are grapes there are hackberry seeds there are uh, sycamore seed balls or brooding heads you could say uh, and uh, this is some kind of nut related, extinct, but related to the hazel. So I got interested in this early on and, and uh, each of these different fossils has its own story to tell you know, about that particular plant group and migration pathways of, of different plant groups over time. So we're looking at nuts and what are nuts? Well, they're, it's a kind of fruit, a botanical fruit uh, with a hard shell and closing a kernel that can be eaten. Or it can be an odd or crazy person like myself that studies such things. And uh, these are some examples of nuts that you're familiar with, I guess, that uh, we do have fossil records for. And these, most of these track back about 50 million years to the Eocene time. So it's it's on page two of that handout that Phyllis provided. We're in the Cenozoic. Um, and here, this is from that same locality in Oregon. This is uh, the oldest acorn that we're aware of. Yeah, you can see it's pretty, these uh, nuts have distinguishing features that allow you to identify them to different groups. And this would be an oak. It has that nice little cap over the, the base or the attachment area of the nut. And interesting that, you know, we have vertebrate fossils, various animals preserved through the same sequence of sediments, even there in Oregon. And it turns out that these, these nuts that I've just been showing you came around before squirrels. Squirrels seem to come in at the latest Eocene or about uh, 34 million years ago. 
So rodents were around and they may have uh, found that these nuts were desirable, but uh, it was, we didn't have squirrels with the specialized teeth for, for uh, opening these really hard shelled nuts. Uh, we can track uh, Coralis, or no, sorry, that's the genus name, in the birch family, the filbert or the hazelnut. We have good fossil records from the state of Washington. That's what we're showing here on the left side are two fossils to, that you can compare with the modern ones that are shown on the right. And here again, this goes back to Eocene time. We have, and those, I should say, that's a lead. The, these earlier pictures I showed, oh, it's not working there. Oh, sorry. So this is preserved in three dimension. This is one that's been replaced by minerals. And these are sort of flattened in the shale. You split these shales with hammer and it opens up and you see the crushed remains of a fruit, but they can be, or a nut, you can recognize them here with this specialized, uh, um, wrap around involucre that is seen in the fossil and the modern. Uh, so these nuts that I've been showing you so far are relatively large, maybe a half inch or larger, big enough to be of interest to squirrels and other animals that might disperse them. And so it's in the plant's interest <laughs> to make a nut that would be desirable to be carried to new locations. You know how squirrels will cache nuts for the winter uh, that, and they don't always return to get them. And so they're dispersing these nuts to new locations um, by, so it's animal dispersal that's happening there. But we do also see things that are uh, smaller nuts that will be attached to a wing. And this wing allows them to blow through the wind and be dispersed. Uh, that way. So this one shown on the left, you might have seen these. I think there's some carpinus trees growing around here on your, your campus area. And it certainly grows in this part of Florida. This, this carpinus or hornbeam has this winged sort of trilobed winged nut and they blow around in the wind. So those can be seen as fossils. And then you also have these, I just showed you the, the coralus or the hazelnut. Uh, is a larger nut uh, that seems to be adapted for animal dispersal. Well, in this same family, those were both in the uh, birch family, but I, and this also is in the birch family. This um, uh, hop horn bean grows here in north central Florida. It, it's uh, native to the eastern U.S. Uh, and also in um, grows in East Asia today, and. Here on the left is a fossil, compressed fossil of one of these bladder-like fruits. It has a little nut that's there and then a surrounding balloon-like covering that helps it in wind dispersal. And this specimen from Oregon is, yeah, it's clearly the same thing, but it's growing, it was preserved as a fossil in an area where this genus no longer lives today. It's, it's extinct from Western North America, but survived here in Eastern North America. So there's some interesting patterns. In here. And this is a one a, a extinct example in that same birch family. It has leaves that look very similar to other living members of the birch family, but it has a this sort of cross-shaped or sometimes pentagonal shaped wing surrounding the nut. Here you can see the nut that has the same kind of ribbing pattern that the modern ones do, but this surrounding set of wings, it looks like it would have blown off the tree like a little helicopter uh, or propeller type thing. Um, it's extinct now. We don't have this living today, but we find it as fossils, not only in Oregon, but also Colorado and Montana. Well, here's a, a closer view of the walnut. That this oldest walnut on the left side. Um, that uh, in this case, I'm showing you some modern examples on the right hand side for comparison, give you an idea of what kinds of features we use for identifying them to that genus. And you can see the seed cavity is, is exposed in this fossil 
on the left, and you can compare that with seed cavities in modern, like this is a black walnut here. And to the outside of where the seed is, the part you eat, there are also little spaces in the nutshell. And you can see those same four spaces here and here in these fossils. So there are a lot of features that seem to fit with the walnuts, but it doesn't fit cleanly into the black walnuts or, or the English walnuts. It seems to have some features that are distinctive, so it's not fitting neatly into, uh, into a particular part of the genus that walnuts are in. So I got interested in this stuff, as I said, as a high school student. Uh, uh, I thought I would work on that fossil locality that had all those nuts preserved, but I got sidetracked in my PhD work. I asked uh, my professor, okay, if I change my project, I think I just want to work on the walnut family. And he said, oh, yeah, that's fine. We weren't, I was not able to contact. He was in Australia on a sabbatical. So there was no cell phone. There was no fax. So I just had to send him this letter. Okay, if I change my project and it took two weeks to reach Australia and two weeks for his answer to come back. So I just thought, well, I hope he's going to say yes. I'm just going to go ahead and start on this. But so uh, my dissertation wound up being on the, the uh, walnut family. And this is kind of a summary chart here. Of, these are the, the modern genera represented by little icons of the, the way that they're the morphology of their nuts. These are modern ones at the top. And then there's a geologic time chart here from going from Cretaceous up through Pliocene and recent. And I have examples of fossils shown um, uh, on this chart to indicate uh, how far we can track some of these back. So this one with a circular wing on it, I'm gonna show you some pictures of that. It's living in China today, it's still living, but we had it in North America as a fossil back in the Paleos. And Various of these modern genera can be traced back about 50 million years or so. Uh, but then we also find their extinct forms. So like this one in the lower right panel with the four wings on it, that's a, an extinct one uh, that didn't make it to the present day, but it's part of, the, part of the story of the history of the walnut family and its uh, biogeographic patterns. This is, uh, uh, so we're in the walnut family now, and you might not have seen these because they're not native to North America today. They grow in uh, Iran and uh, East Asia, Japan and China. And uh, they're recognizable by these two wings that spread out from a central nut. And these uh, fossil examples are from Idaho. Oops, excuse me, the lower one's from Idaho. The upper one is uh, from Japan. And they, we can find them in sediments going back 15 and 20 million years. This one is in that same family. So this thing is about the size of a half dollar or can be down to the size of a quarter. It varies. These are, these are uh, winged fruits. There's a wing that surrounds a nut in the middle. And that nut, if you section it and look in detail, it's just like a walnut. Now, it just happens to be smaller, but it has the same internal features. And you can see their veins running out into the wing in this modern example from China. And the same thing can be seen in this fossil from North Dakota. So we had this thing that we could track back to the Paleocene time in North America. And so uh, here you can see the distribution of modern cyclocaria here. I put it in yellow on this map of showing a bit of the Northern hemisphere. And then all these dots are fossil occurrences. The black dots are the older ones, uh, uh, Eliocene and Eocene. And the white dots are younger occurrences. And we can see that this was formerly spread across the Northern hemisphere and just have us to survive as like a museum where it preserved in, in uh, central China. So here on this chart, I've shown Asia, North America, and European columns. It's extinct in North America, but we have the earliest fossil record um, for the genus. Um, there are good records in, in Europe, but not as old and they don't, uh, it didn't make it to the present day. And so, that this pattern of changing um, distribution of plant groups is kind of interesting. This one is a little bit parallel to ginkgo 
might be familiar with, where it survived in China, but it was once here. This one is extinct uh, Cruciptera. I got to name this as a new genus because it had been just uh, sitting in museum drawers uh, of, and was of uncertain uh, identity. Um, the, the research that was done up until the 1970s and still some of the research going on today in paleobotany, the idea is to try to match your fossil to something living today. Find something that looks identical and then say, well, it's that. And nobody was able to find something that this looked identical to. So it's like, oh, we're keep this one is a failure. We just can't figure it out. And if you take the mindset that, well, it could be extinct, and what group could it could it be related to? It heads you in a new direction. And these fossils, some of these with the wings on them, had beautifully preserved details of the nut. So here is that same fossil cruciptera from Oregon that showed me, oh, it's got to be a walnut family. <laughs> and so this was published in, uh, I don't know, 1990, I think, thereabouts. And then later it was found that the same thing was present in Germany as a fossil. So this thing was present uh, both in Europe and North America. It's in the lineage of the walnuts. It's related to the walnuts and the hickories but it, it's a genus that just didn't make it to the present day. Well, I'd be happy if somebody would find it, that it actually is surviving somewhere, but we haven't noticed it anywhere. Um, this is a question to uh, think about with these walnuts. Uh, did these nuts uh, change uh, by the influence of evolving rodents? These uh, shown on the left panel, the fossils on the left, they're from Wyoming and also from Southern England. They're, they're showing um, a smooth nutshell and the inside part that filled in with sediment here. This part, which is basically the shape of the seed, it's very smooth, it's simple. And these would be, if you were had these in a, with a nutcracker to open, it'd be really nice to just easily open those and get the kernel out. But modern hickory nuts and walnuts have a more complex uh, seed. Uh, convoluted um, seed contents or seed cavity. So this is a latex replica that's been uh, come out of this uh, hickory nut. So there's a, if you compare this convoluted structure to this, it's like, why, why is that so different? Why don't we have any that look like this today? And it may be that that has to do with um, the evolution of squirrels. Uh, uh, this kind of a nut that's so easy to open would have likely been predated, predated by squirrels and eat, easily eaten and that would go into extinction. <laughs> but something like this that encourages that behavior of, of caching the nuts so that they can be eaten as things start to soften. Um, I don't know. It's uh, uh, oh, I thought, so this specimen on the left, this is from uh, the London clay. It's a pyrotized seed or nut from uh, England, Southern England. And this was collected back in the 1920s and it was published in the 1930s. And there only was this one specimen. And uh, I really was interested to know the internal structure of this thing. The ones from, that we find in Wyoming I have a lot of those in our collection um, at, at the Florida Museum. They, they don't have detail of cell structure or wall structure. They're only sediment infills. So this is all siltstone. If you cut it or break it open, there's no original tissue. But this one is petrified in pyrites. So finally, <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, or that's about a month and a half ago, the, the museum, the British Museum, the Natural History Museum, CT scanned that specimen and they sent me the data files to, to work with. And you can now see that same specimen that's been sitting in the collection for years there with the detail. This is a translucent view of the nutshell showing this seed structure inside. And you can see it's very simple seed body. And here we're seeing uh, the cell structure of the wall made up of tiny little 
cells. This kind of detail that we can now get from micro CT scanning is really improving our ability to relate, compare these with modern relatives and other fossils. Um, and I, my question going into this was, is it going to be more like a walnut or more like a hickory nut? And it's not either of those. <laughs> Maybe you remember I was pointing out with the walnut, they have these, these openings in the wall. And that's not here in this specimen, this uh, fossil that's called Juglandicaria. So <laughs> now we're trying to figure out, okay, well, how does this fit into the evolutionary history of the family? Hickory nuts themselves have a good fossil record. One thing that's interesting is about the biogeography of these genus Caria or the hickory, which also includes pecans. It's interesting that they are disjunct in their distribution today. There's some of them live in Eastern North America and down into Mexico, and some are East Asian. There are none in Europe. There are none in Western North America today. But if you can make out, there are a lot of black dots here indicating fossil nut localities scattered around, even in Siberia. There's some in Japan that's just outside the current range of the genus. Um, the, there's a cluster of dots in Europe. And these uh, photos on the left are examples of nuts from the soft coal mines in, in Germany that um, show that hickories were abundant and diverse <laughs> about uh, 20 to 20 million years ago and up to about 5 million years ago in Europe. So, so there were more different kinds there than there are um, at, that we know of as fossils in North America or Asia. And this chunk of rock here on the lower right, those are hickory nuts embedded in a chunk of silicified material chert that was found inside a petrified sycamore log in the state of Washington. So this was near Ginkgo State Park in, in Washington. And you can see there, it has plenty of, plenty of individual nuts there and they all correspond in their details of internal structure to hickory nuts. So um, we can, so it looks like this is reflecting the behavior of squirrels or some kind of rodent that was caching these things together to wind up in, inside a petrified tree like that. And that's giving us interesting information about the history of hickories that they were in Western US, even though they're no longer there. So we're able to document uh, past broader range of these, these um, uh, walnut relatives and also the restricted range. And we can speculate about well, why are they not native in, in Europe today? And I think that has to do with climate change. Uh, this is a sort of fun <laughs> slide to think about. It's actually, I don't think the nuts get as large as this one on display in Missouri, but uh, you can notice in time, if you go back to um, the age of dinosaurs, we have that we can trace the ancestors of the walnut and birch family back farther with uh, well-preserved fossil remains, but they're always, the nuts are small. They're like a millimeter or two. And it's not until you get into the Paleocene and especially Eocene that you start seeing larger nuts of the kind we're familiar with, thinking of larger walnuts and pecans and filberts and things. And uh, so why is that? Um, I think there might be some, we were talking about wind dispersal versus uh, animal dispersal. And I think it could be that, that uh, those early, early examples were more dis frequently dispersed by wind. And as you have the evolution and diversification of rodents, um, there was uh, that invited this, this proliferation of larger nuts that could be dispersed by, by those animals. So I'll move out of uh, walnut family and I'll talk about some other groups. Cashew nuts are interesting, but they're all, this is the native range shown in blue today uh, of that genus Anacardium. That's the same family as the mango, but, uh, and the people that live in the area where this grows, they'll also eat this lower part that we rarely see. It's sort of an in, uh, inflated stock of the, of the nut part that we're more familiar with. So those so-called hypocarps 
are very distinctive. So it uh, means that we can identify these fossils, you know, this fossil on the right, this is one of many specimens from Messel, Germany, this is about 47 million years old. And it shows that inflated stock and the curved familiar uh, cashew shape, similar to what you see on these on the left. And so we were able to, I was collaborating with uh, uh, colleagues in England and Germany, we were able to publish the oldest cashew nuts based on this. And so I, here's where it is today, at the native range of South America, and then we have this one fossil occurrence in, in near, near Frankfurt, Germany. And that's hard. We just have two dots. So, you know, two of the modern occurrence and the fossil, and we can say things changed, but how did they get back and forth? Maybe it passed across the North Atlantic land bridge before Greenland and uh, before the separation of those continents, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Uh, but then they also had to somehow communicate across North America and to South America if that was the pattern. And we don't yet have convincing fossils from of cashews from North America. Tree of Heaven, some of you might have seen uh, these kind of uh, winged fruits. They're about an inch or inch and a half long. And they're, you can find them blowing around the streets in Gainesville because this is a tree that is rather invasive. It grows all over North America today. It's kind of a weedy thing that's not native to North America, but once it gets introduced, these winged seeds, winged fruits, they just blow around and establish new trees all over the place. I've seen them in California and Arizona, but they're native to this area that's shown in red dots here. So India to East Asia and down into the tip of Australia. Um, that's where they grow today, but they're distinctive winged seeds allow you to recognize them as fossils. So here's this one from Wyoming. Here's one from the same site where that cashew came from, I showed you, um, uh, from Messel, Germany. And so we can see that all these blue dots across here are, are fossil occurrences confirmed by these roots. And we can say that the tree of heaven was widespread in the Northern hemisphere and uh, then became extinct over most of the Northern hemisphere, except for this, this part of China. And since it's also in the Southern hemisphere today, there might be a question, did this, did it have its origin in the Southern hemisphere and then invade the Northern hemisphere or was it what Northern hemisphere that invaded the Southern hemisphere? And it's hard to address that question because we don't have any fossils. We haven't found any yet from Australia or New Guinea or China, so it's our southern China. I mean, so uh, we need more fossils, but the picture seems to be <laughs> indicating that it was expanded in the northern hemisphere and then uh, migrated southward. Don't know. Here's Davidia, the tree, uh, the dove tree, it's called the dove tree because of these uh, white uh, bracts that are underneath the flowering head here. You can here is one of the uh, nuts that's exposed with a part of the husk removed. So you can see this woody nut sticking out. Uh, this grows only in central China today. If you section across that, uh, make a transverse or cross section through the nut, you'll see separate seed chambers here. There are like eight or nine here. And each one of those opens by a little valve. So when it's sprouting, you'll have a little new root, a new sprout can come out of each of these uh, openings in that nut. Well, that's uh, only in Asia today. Um, here, this is a black and white image of what I just showed you. But we have fossils of Davidia from North Dakota and Wyoming. Uh, and this is a cross section of the nicely preserved specimens from, what, from North Dakota. And they show that same organization, lots of single seed chambers, and there's a valve that opens just like in the modern ones. And the details of how they're, they're born are sort of lopsided on this stock is also seen in the Wyoming fossils. And these arrows are pointing to the positions of the, where those white showy bracts, the dove bracts are attached. 
And we can see that in the modern examples and also in the fossil. So it looks like Davidia was present in the Paleocene in North America. And we have fossils from Eocene and on uh, to the end of the Eocene in North America. And now they're in Asia. So another pattern, maybe uh, similar that so we've, we've seen in some of these others. The oldest banana that we know of is coming from Oregon. This uh, on the left is the oldest banana fruit. It's rather short. That's a centimeter scale. So the whole thing is maybe a couple inches long. And we find associated. So this impression fossil of fruit on the left shows where the seeds were sitting inside there. A modern banana, that, the kind we eat, usually they're seedless, or you might just see a little black speck that represents where the seed would be if it would develop. Uh, but uh, the modern wild bananas look more, more like this. And so they'll have sizable seeds that would be pretty crunchy. And here's a fossil seed from that same locality I showed in the first slide that in Oregon, uh, showing the detail of has, it has in a longitudinal section of that fossil, you can see the same structure that we see in modern banana seeds. The, maybe you would recognize uh, the kind of uh, fruit we have here, or, or seed, if you will. These are these helicopter-like seeds of maple. And this is a rare specimen where they're still attached with the, on the stock. They're two, they come in twos usually, and then they break apart and flutter down for dispersal. We have good fossil record of, of maples. I'm still looking for a graduate student who might want to focus on that. We've got these, these and their leaves from lots of localities around uh, the Northern Hemisphere. The uh, other, the most closely related other living genus of the maples is this thing that grows only in China today called Dipteronia. And it has, this is a fossil from North America, but this Dipteronia has these two wings as well, but with a completely different pattern of how the veins radiate out from the, from the seed body. Here you can see this Dipteronia, examples of the modern ones from China. And then here is a fossil that's also from China. So they found this back to about 30 million years old in China. But uh, we find that they are just really abundant with lots of occurrences. Here's another fossil from the state of Washington. Uh, we have them from Wyoming and Oregon and into British Columbia. And these uh, fossils are distinctive enough we can be sure it's, it is that modern genus, Dipteronia. And again, we have an example of a whole area where they were common in North America, and now they're extinct in North America, but surviving with two species in China. Uh, some of my <clears throat> more recent work has been on, <clears throat> excuse me, on India and looking at fossil uh, seeds and, and uh, fruits that are preserved in sediments that were deposited at the time, right at the end of the dinosaur period, the Cretaceous uh, Cenozoic boundary. Uh, and at that time, India was an island that separated from the uh, Northern Hemisphere continents that it now has affixed to. And there are interesting biogeographic stories there. Uh, that we don't have time to get into. <laughs> but uh, we go there and collect these chunks of chert that solidified pond muck. Did you? I didn't. She asked, but I like some water. And it's, oh, no. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so we collect the chert. <clears throat> Excuse me. This uh, is full of fossil plant remains that have been. It was probably deposited near hot springs and the minerals were depositing in the end of those plant remains. And what we have here is the oldest grape or oldest raisin. Uh, with uh, These are fossils on the right that section through that, that same chunky chert material that I mentioned. And you can see the similarity with the grape, the fruit. I can't say grapefruit, that's a different one. The fruit of a grape <coughs> on the left side here. And these, you can see seeds that are inside these fossil fruits of grape. And 
we're able to use this uh, uh, technology of superimposing successive sections through a specimen together and get a to get a three dimensional view of these things now. You have the same kind of software that's used for CT scan and uh, other kinds of uh, three dimensional imaging, but this is done with successive um, peels through the chert, showing the seeds in their position as you go down through the rock. Uh, the significance of this is that these are the oldest grapes. And these are what modern seeds of all of the genera in the grape family look like today. And we can look at the seeds of this fossil and compare them. They're quite close to, here's modern grape vitus. And there's also similarity to this, another, another branch of the family tree down here. They're also similar. We weren't able to verify that it's the oldest grape itself, but it's certainly in that family and it has a lot of similarities to the modern grape seeds that you see in the lower um, two panels or the lower two rows on the panel to the right. So it seems that grapes uh, may have come out of India, that is. They, so those fossils are from when India was uh, isolated as an island. It hadn't impacted into Asia yet, so the Himalayas were not developing yet. Uh, so it may be that uh, the, we find lots of fossil grape seeds in Europe and North America in younger sediments, Eocene and younger, but not Cretaceous. So maybe they came from India. So that got me interested in all these other fossils from India. Here's the oldest pomegranate relative. So these are uh, just the last gasp of the Cretaceous, so 66 million years or so. And here is, uh, this was first published as being a banana. It looks a little bit similar to the banana I showed you before, but it's so well preserved, we were able to see the seeds inside. And here's some CT scans of those seeds on, on the right-hand panel. <clears throat> uh, and even the embryos are preserved inside those um, seeds. Uh, by doing a broader comparison in the whole uh, group of families that includes the ba banana family, we found that this actually is in the ginger family. So we're able to trace the earliest ginger relatives back to... Um, you said the banana is in the ginger family? Yeah, but the banana family is in the same order as the ginger family. Sorry, I sort of... <laughs> Trying, trying not to use the technical names, uh, but uh, yeah, the, the banana family and the ginger family are in the Zingiberales order. And so the people that identified as a banana back in the 1960s, they are, uh, he was right in a general sense that it was sort of in that group, but it turned out not to actually be the oldest banana, but the oldest ginger, which is still okay. <laughs> so I, sorry, this has been kind of going this way and that way, but uh, I want to just sort of give you a flavor of some of the things I find interesting to, to look at. Um, one of the points here would be to say that these uh, nuts that we're familiar with today, they have a long history predating humans. I mean, we only go back a few million years and we're talking 50 million years for most of these. And they, we can look at uh, these fruits and seeds and see how they were adapted for different dispersal mechanisms. So some of them are wind dispersal, and some are uh, carried by rodents and other birds and other animals. We can use details that are available by sectioning these things and by CT scanning to compare with modern ones. And that allows us to identify them to particular families. If we can do that, then we can look at how the families have changed over time, uh, both in the features of those, those plants and in the distribution geographically. And uh, so um, we can, uh, yeah, consider, okay, I've shown you set, uh, multiple examples of different patterns of distribution geographically. Uh, that we had 50 million years ago compared to today. A lot of times it's something survived in China, but it was in North America, or sometimes it survives 
today, both in Eastern North America and Eastern Asia, but they were in Europe and they were in Western North America. And so there, I think that that has to do with climate change. You know, the Eocene time that I've been talking about was warm climate interval that we seem to be heading back into now. At that time, oh, I should mention, <laughs> I don't have a lot of Eocene fossil nuts from, from Florida. We have one palm nut. But we have marine deposits of that age. So that's because, you know, when the climate gets that warm, Florida is underwater, under ocean water. And so I go to Wyoming and we're still upland and I can collect good plant fossils. I'll stop there. Thank you. I have a I have I don't think it's working. That's for the people online, I think. Yeah. Is it green? Yes. Mm -hmm. oh. Okay. I'll get my question if you'll repeat it for those online. I actually have two questions. First, and they're very different. One, um, can you give any information about what you're finding or what they are finding at the Mockbrook uh, date, which is uh, ongoing now? So let's get that one first. Yeah. Question about the Mockbrook dig um, near Williston, um, here locally. Um, I keep asking them to bring me plant remains. They're finding all kinds of neat uh, skeletal remains. But we may be able to infer what plants were around by their dentition. But so far, we have not been finding seeds. I keep reminding them, please, please look for those. <laughs> My second question uh, relates to some of the maps that you showed, because with the exception of the Cashew, nothing was going on in the Southern Hemisphere. And is there an explanation for that, your research or whatever? Yeah, your name is Judy Geyer. Judy, Judy Geyer has a, another question about that. She noticed, thanks for noticing, <laughs> that my maps are mostly showing all the action was in the Northern Hemisphere. And what about the Southern Hemisphere? Um, I think there are two things that's reflecting. Partly, we have very few paleobotanical localities from Africa. We have scattered sites in Australia and quite a number from South America. And we find that, that just like today, the flora is quite different. There are different um, families and, and genera living today in Australia, like eucalyptus and things that, that we don't find in the Northern Hemisphere. But you'll see um, now we're finding a lot of cases of plants that are found as fossils, eucalyptus and tentacle, found as fossils in South America, where it doesn't live today, that show a relationship to, to uh, Australia and New Guinea, and it looks like they were passing across uh, Antarctica uh, before those continents were separated. So, so far, we're not seeing as much, as many examples of, of plants that are shared between the northern and southern hemisphere. I'm still interested. There's a new curator of paleobotany at the Field Museum in Chicago, and that's one of his specialties. His, his uh, name is Fabiani Herrera, and he did his PhD here with Gilker and myself. And uh, he's been he's, uh, involved with studying the Panama Canal fossils that were collected as part of a project that, that we were involved with, uh, and a lot of fossils from Colombia. There's a group from Cornell with a lot of problems in Argentina as well. And so we're starting to get a much better sense of what was happening in South America. I wish we had that for Africa. I think the fossils are there, but people studying that part not going to get funded. Thank you. In some of the animal fossils, it's possible to get DNA out. Then yes, possible in the seeds. That's a question about uh, um, 
can we get DNA from seeds as they do from snail? Uh, from elephants or astronauts or something like that. Uh, with uh, seeds, uh, fossils, I'm not aware of examples where there's been success to get DNA from fossil seeds. There have been some cases from fossil leaves from Idaho that are about 15 million years old where they have been able to get, or they have reported getting DNA out of magnolia and laurel, a few other things, uh, I think also uh, the a relatively involved cypress. They managed to get short fragments of, of DNA. And this most of that work was done uh, decades ago. And more recently, no one has followed that one. Uh, I shouldn't say no one. We tried and failed. We went to the same locality in Idaho and collected some of that material for sycamores. We wanted to look at see if we get DNA of the sycamore and leaf. And we were very careful and kept all of the fossils, dug out these fossils and put them in the ice chest and kept them cool and dry it back to Gainesville. And we, uh, we, I had a graduate student who was really interested in trying to get the DNA out and did all the techniques and that failed. He was so disappointed. So he, went, he decided to leave, leave science and went into the teaching, which is a big help as well. But I felt bad because. There's a lot of other information we can get from the fossils. From the, we can look at this, the details of the stomata on the surface and compare the distribution of stomata at that time with what we have today. You can, um, you can look at cell sizes that correlate with, with the um, genome size or, or chromosome size. Um, there, there are things that we can do. We just can't, so we're not at the point where we can be extracting the original genome. I, I think Dr. Manchester, we have a question here on Zoom. Rick Gold, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, in your final slide, you talked about uh, interaction with mammals. Could you go into depth on that? I can speak a little bit about that. Um, we uh, one thing that's interesting is with as you look at the evolution of of rodents. They have a dentition that is becomes increasingly sophisticated and uh, adaptive for gnawing on hard nutshells. And as we look at the fossil remains of nuts, we see over time, if we track from the Eocene on into the Miocene, we start getting getting nuts that are thicker shelled and more um, strongly ornamented, some of them like really grooved and ridged and sharp and pointy. Uh, so it seems, I don't know if this is co-evolution, but it certainly seems like that that influence of, of the evolving rodents uh, correlates with changes that we see in those nuts. Um, if I may add something here, yeah. is this working? No. 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 Uh, in the when I was uh, studying with the Otterbein University courses twenty years ago, I did a project on um, the big pulpy, the, the, the seeds that are surrounded by the pulp like banana, for example, or grape, or mango, or avocado. Now, we're not, this is not something that you apparently spend much time on, but the implication of what I, of the literature that I was reading is that the tree, the plant, would design, was working in coordination over millions of years with the animals that would disperse their seeds. And so the larger animals, like the one I was studying, Brontosphere, the size of a small elephant, uh, theoretically was eating things like mangoes and avocados. Um, this was um, a, a very late Eocene, early um, Ordovician animal. So uh, there, there were many different ways that these plants uh, sought to uh, optimize their reproduction. So, 
Uh, if you don't mind, that I'm interjecting here. Please do. It's nice to have a conversation, not just going one way. I, did you, uh, I don't know if we uh, did a decent job of addressing your question. Do you have? My question? No, it was, was it Rick that? Okay. Yeah, that's fine, thanks. Okay, okay. yeah, thanks. That the Natalie uh, possibly found an oral. Yeah. Was that when it was tropical during that time? That one? Yeah, that, that banana fossil is from uh, from Eocene rocks in Oregon. And Eocene was a time of uh, maximum warming of the climate. So at that time, we also find palm leaves in Alaska <laughs> and the fossils. Yeah, yeah. 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 So when I'm trying to identify those fossils, I, I have to keep in mind, I have to compare with modern plants, not to just throw around Oregon. I have to think of North Province today, and Panama, Tropical Asia, and the banana seed. I, that was just sort of luck that I would, would, you know, had learned what those fossil seed mystery seeds look like. And I went up to the National Seed Collection that was in Bellsville, Maryland. And they let me just go through. Every drawer of modern seeds and they gave me permission to cut them so I could see <laughs> make sections with a little saw that I brought with me and a section for the Anna seeds that matched. It's like a modern one match these fossils. So I was able to go, oh, so that's what this is. And then so I described the seed fossils, and I was happy with that. I worked with a specialist on, on that family and because the modern seeds that we published that together, and then later I realized. We have that, we have fruits, that fossil fruit that I showed. <laughs> it, it was in our collection and I hadn't been paying attention to it. It was another unknown thing. And so that was the second paper that came along in uh, maybe 1991 or something. And the article was, yes, we have bananas. <laughs> so that got a lot of news coverage. And this thing made the day better. I've <laughs> heard that was really Bananas is that they're actually a and pineapple also. Yeah, botanists have their classification of a different fruit types. So I've been talking a lot about nuts, but I think uh, berries have tomatoes and berry too. It's talking about the complete how the seeds are born. Well, you know, and then they'll say things like a strawberry, not a berry, or blackberry. Yeah, I, I thought I would avoid that, but you're yeah. talking about it anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, strawberry, are those little, the little seed like things on the outside, those are individual fruits. And the whole big fleshy part we like is expanded sort of stock of the whole receptacle. Yeah. <laughs> but different parts can, can develop into the fleshy tissue that, that is benefiting by dispersal of, from birds or mammals or other organisms. We might eat the strawberry, but this those little little fruitlets or seeds that will survive and be in a nice little plop of fertilizer. Are they on the outside of it when the fruit falls and you get new plants as they're laying on the ground? Yeah, yeah that's that's one way and I think more commonly, it's eaten by somebody and they don't digest it completely. Somebody, some fruit, and then it's nicely deposited in a pile of fertilizer in a new location. It's going to be away from the parent farm. Dave has a question. Do you happen to know? Do you happen to know how the macadamia nut tree is doing? Because fellow dictionary wise, I think it's gone too far. It's an uncrackable shell. <laughs> they have to uh, devise machinery to do it, and I don't know if it's a mammal. Is that why they're so expensive? Is that why they're so expensive? Yeah, I don't know. So that family of nuts are, let's see. They're actually, they're seeds mm -hmm. rather than nuts. But speaking. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if they're actually special. You'll think you'll be wise. But where was it from? Not not uh, Hawaii. Oh, isn't it? Isn't it uh, um, Australia? Australia. I thought it was Australia. That's what I said. My 
Why? I know it's not native. Why? I, I can say that we've not found any fossils of it in the northern hemisphere, um, and even though we've looked. <laughs> and I think that might be because of its main mystery with the southern hemisphere. But, uh, but I do know that it's actually the sea rather than not. I can think of it all. Okay. And I um I read a lecture by a Chilean economist uh, 20 years ago uh, who asserted that the the original parent tree that all other trees in South America are derived from are beech, that all the other trees species. Now I think he was just talking about Chile. I don't know, but he that he made that assertion, and I was really quite astonished because if you think about the Amazon diversity of the botanical diversity in the Amazon, it can't all be from beech trees. You have to say, yeah, I, uh, I know that there's a big radiation of what's called the southern beech in South America, and that southern beech called Notho Vegas genus mm -hmm. that's also. Um, you know, spread around in Australia. And around so there's a big biogeographic story about how it was more widespread than fossil record is today. But yeah, yeah, not a lot of distribution. But I haven't heard people saying that that's uh, what's yeah, that these other plants like tomatoes and things that come from South America and do off of that. The vegetation may have changed, and they may have dominated. Them. Other things. So, so, one thing I didn't mention much is about that. Why are these plants uh, extinct in Western North America and surviving in China? I think that has to do with uh, climate cooling and glaciation. The glaciers that came south in North America just eradicated a lot of stuff. And, and in Europe, there was no place to go. The Mediterranean, Mediterranean sort of cut them off from migrating farther south. Uh, in the last, well, I mean to say in, in East Asia, the mountain ranges are going more transverse or west and east and west, and not as many going north and south like our Rocky Mountains. So there were pockets where things could survive when these cold fronts came south. There are a couple of big uh, climate uh, changing uh, events. Uh, the impact of India uh, into Asia and formation of the Himalayas and the high Tibetan plateau at an average elevation of 15,000 feet apparently changed wind patterns. Uh, but we also have the closing of the Panamanian Isthmus uh, about three million years ago. Uh, which changed the heat redistribution patterns of the oceans. So that was another big uh, climatic change that it made some places more arid and some places wetter around the planet. Um, I, I just think, excuse me, I, I guess I get chills thinking about this. <laughs> it was chilly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anybody else online want to chat? Or, okay. Well, thank you again. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Next week, we'll have Dr. Polinsky. Thank you. 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 Thank you.